Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Adams and it's my pleasure to be speaking to you today on behalf of the Open Data Cube Steering Council. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what we do as a council um, and what we've got planned for the next, uh, our next sort of projects. So I wanted to talk about the fact that um, the council exists to ensure the long-term well-being of the Open Data Cube project and that's both in terms of the technology but also the broader community that makes that technology possible. We run monthly meetings where we discuss things like code architecture, um, event planning such as this conference and how we can be better supporting the community to do the development that makes the Open Data Cube um, such a great piece of open source software. Um, if you, as a part of your organization, have been contributing to the Open Data Cube for a year, um, you can actually have a representative on the steering council. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to talk to me or our previous chair, Alex Leith, or our upcoming chair, which I'll announce at the end. If you want to learn more about the governance, you can see that on our GitHub. So for most of this talk, I want to cover some of the highlights we've had from the past year. So in terms of being an open source project, the Open Data Cube was recently um, awarded a status of becoming an OSGEO community project. And that's really important because it recognizes the work that's been put into this project and helps us promote it. Um, this was a process that was led by Alex Leith, who was our previous um, chair of the steering council and we'd really like to thank uh, Bruce Bannerman and Joni Garnett for their support and part of this process. We are looking to continue this work to go to a full OSGEO project status and that involves a full code license audit. So something I think that's been really cool in the past 12 months is how the Open Data Cube has progressed to allow the creation of continental scale products. So there are two tools that we use for doing this. One is Alchemist and one is Statistician. So the way that Statistician works is that it's there to summarize huge quantities of Earth observation data. So a really good example is the Digital Earth Africa GeoMAD product, which condenses two petabytes of data into annual geomedians uh, plus deviations. The, as an alternative, if you want to move beyond um, standard summary statistics, we also have the Alchemist product, which um, Digital Earth Australia has used to make the collection three Landsat derivative products such as water observations from space um, and fractional cover. And you can see that uh, these processes use you know, huge numbers of processes and um, huge amounts of memory. But I think it's really amazing that the Open Data Cube can now process data on this sort of scale. Um, if you're interested in interacting with data, and particularly through Google Earth Engine, um, the CIOS Systems Engineering Office now has an Open Data Cube sandbox that's based out of Google Colab. So this is a Jupyter Notebook interface where you can log in for free, and access Google Earth Engine data using um, all the sort of higher level APIs that you're familiar with from the Open Data Cube. Um, so you can try that out at openearthalliance.org slash sandbox. So we also have um, our open web services and this is what lets us look at Earth observation data um, sort of in our browsers and um, other places where we can access the web. So in the last 12 months, there have been lots of highlights from this, including a much more sort of regular and routinely tested um, automated uh, release schedule with updates every, you know, every month. Um, there have also been significant improvements to the user documentation, including sort of multilingual metadata um, and how to use styling. Um, and I think this is really great because it's actually now become sort of a standalone API that you could use, you know, in something like a notebook, not just uh, in the standard renderer. So um, there are many, many more updates about that, which you can uh, speak to Paul about if you're interested. 
So finally, um, I'd like to speak a little bit about ongoing projects. So these are the things that we've been working on and will continue to work on into the future. I definitely um, encourage you to speak to the people involved if it's something you'd like to use for your organization um, or in your own work. So the first one is making sure that the Open Data Cube can support multi-dimensional data sets. Um, this is some being done by Peter Wang at CSIRO um, and is part of a Open Data Cube enhancement proposal. So this is where you can um, talk to the council about things you want to contribute directly to the Open Data Cube. Um, so this is allowing the Open Data Cube to support not just um, you know, spatial and temporal um, data sets in terms of only having a sort of X and Y axis, but actually allowing support for an additional uh, dimension or more. So for example, it could be um, the Z dimension, it could be a wavelength, it could be a height if you're working with LiDAR data, um, and the possibilities go on. So it uses um, ZAR in order to do the sort of 2D and 3D reading, and I think that this is going to be something that really helps the Open Data Cube extend beyond just um, the sort of surface reflectance products that we're all really uh, familiar with into things like uh, LiDAR and hyperspectral. So the other thing that's um, really interesting is how the Open Data Cube is starting to work with uh, the stack metadata standard. So this is a metadata standard that's being used by lots of different um, Earth observation providers around the world. And so at the moment, the Open Data Cube can um, effectively index from the uh, from stack documents, which are these JSON documents describing where data is located and how it's organized both in um, space and time. And that's really great, but that still means you um, have an open data cube that needs a database uh, containing where, you know, the location of all your data. That's what, what we call indexing. So the step that we want to take next is to kind of separate that indexing process out of needing to load data. And what that really means is that when you come to use the open data cube, you will be able to query existing um, stack API implementations such as through Digital Earth Australia, Digital Earth Africa, Element 84, Microsoft's Planetary Computer, Planet, OpenEO, so many others. And you will be able to query that data directly and once you've identified the data that you want to load, you will be able to just do that with the ODC without having to set up your own database. Um, this is one of the major challenges of new users, and I'm sure anyone here who's attempted to it has run into um, troubles with indexing. So we're really um, excited about this approach. It will really um, reduce the learning curve for using the Open Data Cube and means that um, you or someone at your organization will be able to set up an environment for you where you can load data without needing to worry about the database. Um, so that's definitely something we're super excited about. So finally, I'd like to introduce you all to our uh, new chair for this year. So Syed uh, Rizvi is taking over from Alex Leith for the next year. Um, Syed works at the Analytical Mechanics Associates, AMA, uh, in the US, and currently supports the Committee on Earth Observing Satellites, uh, their system engineering office. So he's previously played a significant role in the development of the African Regional Data Cube, um, which was the precursor to Digital Earth Africa. And he's really excited to be taking on this role. So um, we're very happy as a council to welcome him into that role. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in what the council's doing or our plan for the next 12 months, please speak to me or Alex or Syed during the conference um, and any of the other presenters listed on the slides as well. Um, I hope you have a wonderful time here at the conference. Thank you.